All right, well, you guys excited to talk about Jesus this morning? Yeah. We're talking about Jesus, but we're also going to talk about us, and uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, the, the title of uh, this sermon today is, is called The Dirty Little Strength Killers, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I thought it was kind of a fun title, so maybe that'll get you excited. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Um, God, that we can go, that we have a place to go for truth. Um, that we have a place to go where we can um, discover better ways to to live our live and lead our lives, God. And um, yeah, so Father, we just give you permission this morning to speak to our hearts, God, and and uh, bring victory this morning and, and breakthrough. And um, if if there's any hangups, God, we just ask that you uh, powerfully remove them this morning in Jesus' name. So we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Amen. So I call this uh, message the Dirty Little Strength Killers because I want to talk about this um, a little bit. There's these, there's these little things that happen to us in our life that love to take us out of the fight. And a lot of these little things are, they, they, they feel big in the moment, but they're actually small. And uh, these things could be, you know, mistakes that we make. How many of you guys make mistakes? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, these are things that uh, maybe just sometimes go wrong. How many of you guys have uh, things that go wrong? You're doing the best you can, and things go wrong. It's, it's not even like you mean to, and something goes wrong. Um, this could just be, you know, what we would call bad luck, right? And, you know, you do something, and, you know, it, 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 it turns into something else that, that is kind of a pain or a frustration in your life. And, and these little things, even though as I talk about them, they seem small, in the moment, they can be incredibly powerful and incredibly damaging to us if we're not um, prepared in advance for these sort of things. And as we talk about these sort of things, the first thing I want to share is, is that, um, or, or at least make clear something you probably already know, is um, when it comes to things we can't control, we can't control them, right? And the, the, the chances of us somehow like cleansing the world of these things, or at least our world of these things, is, is like slim to none. And so we should probably, instead of, of, of trying to live a life that is, you know, uninterrupted or, um, you know, uh, free from any sort of, you know, hindrance from these little things, just accept the fact that sometimes things are going to happen that are going to get under our skin. And um, we should, instead of just letting that happen without preparation, we should think about this in advance uh, so that our strength isn't killed or taken from us. How many of you guys in those moments find yourself dealing with frustration, anger, or any of those sorts of emotions? I certainly do. And it's usually over the little things. It's not the things that I planned. It's the little things that happen in between all of that that actually take me out of the game a lot easier than the, the bigger stuff. So uh, these are the kind of things that will take us from, um, you know, a feeling, you know, strong like I'm a 10 to a two in a matter of, of seconds, okay? So I want to talk about uh, four of these that I have, or actually, I think I just have three. I had four yesterday, so we're going to go with three uh, little strength killers. I had one, and I kind of got rid of it because I was like, I don't know if I want to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> come and ask about it later, and we can have a little bit of like, you know, uh, extracurricular conversation. But uh, the first one is that I wrote down is a strength killer is mistakes that I make that confirm negative beliefs that we have about ourselves or myself, right? So how many of you guys, like, you're doing the best you can, and you make a mistake, and you just feel like you're kind of a loser? Anybody? All right, me too. Me too. Maybe somebody has, you know, put that thought in your mind that you're not good enough, or you don't measure up, or whatever it is, or maybe it's just, you know, you know, trying to battle, like, your own negative self-talk, because I certainly deal with that, and then I make a mistake, and then it kind of confirms the, the fears that I have about myself, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, the second one is, is, uh, is our stress levels um, when they're at max capacity, right? And I think a lot of us, um, we know how much stress we can handle, and it, say there's like a ceiling here of stress, right? And we know like this is my ceiling, we tend to pack our lives full of stress to that point, right? And we're like, well, that's my ceiling, so I'm going to let myself be stressed out to the ceiling because I can handle that. Well, what's the problem with that? 
As soon as something gets added to your stress, you break through the ceiling, right? And so these are the little things that, that can just set you off. They, they're small, um, but because you're living at such a, a, a high stress level anyway, they actually cause you to snap. How many of you guys understand that you only have so much capacity to handle stress, right? Like, th this is true. If you don't know that, you're not paying attention. <laughs> we, we can only handle so much. And, and when, when we get pushed too far, we have a lot of really bad outbursts and stuff like that. How many of you guys would agree with that? That when you, you get past that, that point, your response is usually not a healthy one. That, same for me. And then the third uh, strength killer that I want to talk about is hope deferred. And uh, this is like, you know, hoping for something good to happen, but instead it goes a different direction. How many of you guys have experienced that? You're, you know, really hoping that something works out a certain way. Next thing you know, it's, you know, something happens that either uh, delays the thing that you wanted or maybe makes it uh, seem impossible, uh, something like that. So th that would be the third one. And, and we're going to talk about all these a little bit. Um, but I want to share just some of my own stories, if that's okay, and just be vulnerable with you on on my own mistakes that confirm negative beliefs. Now, the the way that I came to doing this message uh, was that in the last week and a half, I've had a lot of really random, like, dumb things happen that have, like, had these effects on me, right? And so I started to think about it, and I'm like, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's a message here. So, um, okay, so... On Sunday um, morning, so tomorrow morning, I will get up and I have a Blackstone griddle and I will cook pancakes, bacon, eggs, and, and I will do, like, be the, the hero dad and I will show up with, to my family with all this great food, right? Sounds good, huh? You guys probably want to come over. And the cool thing about, this is not a Blackstone commercial, but you can cook it all at once. It's pretty amazing. So last week, I'm cooking all, and my wife doesn't, she's with the kids, so maybe She's going to find out some things that I haven't told her yet. <laughs> um, Chelsea hates to waste food, right? She grew up that way. I'm a, I mean, I don't like to waste food, but I, I'm, I'm not like, I don't hate it. So um, I, I, <laughs> I know there's kids in somewhere starving, and I'm probably... I don't know, but I, I just like, if something looks old or, you know, like if there's just a little bit left or whatever, or if I accidentally waste it or ruin it, I'm kind of like whatever, but she's, she's very different. She knows how much it costs to buy, and like, so wasting food is a big no-no in our house. So anyway, I, I end up like cooking this big breakfast, baking all this stuff, and I like to put stuff away as I cook, anybody like that kind of try to get stuff put away. And uh, when it's over, you know, when I'm done cooking, I call everybody to the table and I feel really good about it. And uh, so I turned off the Blackstone and I, I went inside and we all ate and we went on about our business. And then come uh, Tuesday, and it's super hot outside, right? I go outside and I'm going to cook something else in the Blackstone and I look over to the side and I see the whole pack of bacon is just cooking in the sun. And so I'm like, oh my God gosh, you idiot. Like, and in that moment, like I had some really negative emotions about myself. You know, it's not like I did it on purpose or anything like that. It's not like I, you know, uh, uh, about 99 times out of 100, I usually put the bacon away. But this one time I had forgotten to put the bacon away and it, it really kind of upset me. And I had to remind myself that like, I'm not a terrible person. I'm not a failure. It's just bacon and all that good stuff. Uh, but it's difficult, right? Uh, the same week, I had another Blackstone fail. I cooked dinner and uh, I brought all the food in. I love to cook on this thing, by the way, if you can't tell. Uh, Matt Gruber, he knows what I'm talking about. He, he doesn't have a Blackstone, but he knows, he knows how cool these things are. And uh, I, I'm like, cooking all this food and I bring it in and I look over at the two burners and I'm like, oh, they're off. And uh, so I turn off the other two burners when I'm done and I bring everything in. Well, the next morning I go out and I look at the Blackstone and the far two burners weren't off. They were just turned all the way down to low. So they looked like they were off. So I've been leaking propane all night long. Also, not a good thing in the Griggs household to waste propane. 
<laughs> and so I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible, right? So I'm like, again, I'm feeling, you know, what a loser, you know, and, and talking myself out of it, right? Uh, so later the same day, uh, Jackson has a little fishing pole, and I'm like, hey, do you want to see Daddy's fishing pole? And he's like, yeah, and so I bring in my fishing pole, right, which is huge, and I give it to Jackson in the house, and he's like swinging around and whacking everything, and like, <laughs> it's a disaster, and then his mom comes home, and he's like, look at Daddy's fishing pole, and whacks her, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing giving a kid? It's got like hooks on it and everything, so it's like, <laughs> it's not even safe, man. And I'm thinking, like, dang it, shouldn't have done that. Um, Then, you know, probably the same day, later that night, we're trying to get Bodhi to sleep. And um, have you, I don't know if you've ever had, maybe the guys will know this, maybe more than girls, maybe girls you can relate to, but like husbands out there, have you ever had your wife tell you to be quiet and for some reason you're like louder (laughs) after that than you've ever been in your life? Like, (laughs) you're like, dropping stuff and banging stuff around it's like you're not trying to but it's just getting crazy and so that night she's trying to put the baby to sleep she's like all right be quiet and so I'm like all right I'm gonna be really quiet I just start tripping over stuff and just making a total disaster right and so those are the those that's one area of 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 what I would call uh dirty little um strength killers right it's these little things that we don't mean to do but they're just happening. They're mistakes that we make. And these things are the kind of things that can confirm negative beliefs that we have about ourselves, right? Um, Which is actually, you know, if anybody were to come and and look from the outside in, they would say, dude, you just made a mistake, right? So it's, you you can see how they're little things, but in the moment, they don't feel so little, right? So we're going to talk in a minute about how to deal with those. Um, You know, uh, for me, stress, when my stress is at max capacity, um, the other day I was reaching in to make Jackson's breakfast and I was grabbing his uh, granola that he likes on his cereal and I knocked over a whole open bag of these like delicious little chocolate um, Girl Scout cookie balls that you get at Costco. And uh, (laughs) yeah, Yeah, there's like, and there's like 800 in there and they all just like, fall directly out of the bag into the bottom of our uh, our little closet there, and there's, they're just buried and, and gone. And so I had to stop, you know, everything that I was doing, and I have a routine, right, in the morning, kind of do the same thing every time and, and pick up, like, 800 of these little things and make sure they don't have hair on them and stuff and, like, put them back. <laughs> I'm not going to throw those away. There's <laughs> There are certain things that I don't waste, and that's... That's chocolate or anything related to chocolate. <laughs> um, you know, we've been building this like gazebo in our backyard and we built a lot of it and we got these roof panels. You know, you, you spend like a couple grand on these kits and they don't tell you that it's like one of the hardest things in the world to actually put together. Like I would have just paid an extra thousand dollars to have it. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'm putting the roof pieces on. We've done everything. And Stefan was there with me. And we can't get these things to fit. You know, for whatever reason, like, they just won't fit. And so, you know, it's like in these moments of like, you know, he was, you were with me. And we're working like past dinner trying to get these things to fit. And they just won't fit. And uh, it's frustrating, right? And these are the kind of things, too, if, if you've done any projects and like eight things go wrong, and two things go right. These are the kind of things that when you're living at a high stress, you know, that, that will push you over. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the other day I was trying to move a, a, a bag off the, the, the table for dinner and I knocked over three candles right in a row. I'm just moving a bag. You guys probably think I'm the clumsiest person in the world. <laughs> I'm, I don't think I am, but, but you know, it's, it's these things that it's like you, they're not in your control. You're not meaning to do them, but they add something. They add a task to the tasks that you're already doing, and therefore they frustrate you. Um, hope deferred for any of you guys, you know, I'll share a little story with this, an example. Um, I have... Uh, In my my 20s, I had gotten caught up in drugs and, you know, no violent crimes, no sex crimes, nothing like that, but drug-related crimes, and I got some felonies on my record. And uh, the the last time was, I was, it's 2007, so it's about 18 years ago, almost, 17 years ago. It's been a a while. How long? 17 years ago. 
So I've been going through this process of getting my record expunged, and I, Chelsea and I have been working really hard on it, and we've got it all cleared up, and, and I was going to go and buy a firearm because I've never been able to own a firearm, right? And I'm not trying to tell you what your view on guns should be. I'm just telling you, like, that's what I went and did. And everything online, all these, like, lawyer stuff said that I should, in Oregon State law, I should be able to purchase this item. So I get on to uh, this, uh, this site that does auctions and I get a great deal. And so it's still like a thousand bucks, but I got like $400 off by doing this auction. I feel really good about myself and I go to get it and then they deny me. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, what? I just spent a thousand dollars on this thing, right? So I'm already, my hope is deferred and I get on the internet and I look and it says that in March of this year, Oregon changed their, the way that they interpret the law, and now you have to do a whole extra step, right, to totally be free of all that stuff. And I felt pretty, pretty sad because I was, you know, for me, it's not about getting the gun so much as it is about, like, getting that gun for me is, like, proof that, like, the state, like, I finally have done enough to be forgiven, right? And that's so it means more to me than just like, dang it, you know, it's, it's like a sign, a symbol of like, I've actually moved on from, which I have, right? And so I was really crushed because I'm like, what else can I do? <laughs> you know, like what else can I do? And, and anyway, Chelsea calmed me down and got my hope restored again. And I found the, the courage to uh, get back up and, and go through the next process that, that they require. Um, but those are little things that can can defer hope, right? And that they can, they can really steal your strength in the moment because you, when you're hoping for something, it, it means something to you, right? And, you're, and, and hope is really is like, man, I'm really hoping that this happens. And then there's these things that sometimes happen that, that can steal our hope, right? And how many of you guys have experienced that? I mean, maybe not the same way I'm talking, but have experienced your, your hope stolen and that's a very um that's just a rough place to be that's a rough uh really rough place to be so what's the solution so i want to talk about the solution to these things because i think we can all relate in one way or another to the stuff i'm talking about um the solution isn't to live reactionary and only chase the symptoms okay because i think that's a lot of times how we deal with stress and these little strength killers is that we find ways to deal with it after it's happened right now i'm not saying that that's bad I, if, if you get to a point where you're breaking i think it's a good thing that you have a plan maybe somebody to talk to who can encourage you somebody who can bring you back to you know a good place i think it's really important if you get there but I don't want to just live that way where I'm allowing small things uh, to put me in such a state that I just feel completely um, de defeated. Um, so what I want to talk about is, or the question that I would ask myself is like, okay, these responses I have to these strength killers, what are they really pointing to? Well, I would think that they're pointing to something a lot deeper, right? So there's something within me that is that, that, that is not happening in advance, that is allowing me to get to this place where small things can have big um, explosions in my life, right? And I really believe that the solution to this can be found in the scripture. I really believe that, you know, the, the Bible is full of all kinds of great wisdom and truth that can keep us from getting into these places. The problem is, well, I have... I have Three, three problems that, that, that might, um, you know, be the reason that, that that's not working is, number one, sometimes we don't trust the Scripture. And what I say is, like, we can read the Bible, and you can say, I believe that, but deep down, do you trust it, right? Sometimes it's too scary, or it feels too risky, or it's just like, I, I just can't, I can't live that way. Uh, number two, sometimes we don't know the Scripture, right? Sometimes people, you know, just don't know the Bible verses, right? The, the stuff that, that helps us to, to have victory over these things. And then the third one, and this is a big one, is, yeah, I, I trust it, um, I know it, but I actually just don't live, I don't live it out. And, and this is what I really want to talk about 
today is this, this last one about not, not applying Scripture to our lives. So, you know, in all these, um, these areas of, of strength killers, the, the one thing we're going to handle right now is not knowing the Scripture, right? So I'm going to read you guys some Scripture so you know what the Bible says and, uh, and, and have that be um, how you get victory. So let's talk about self-worth. Is God's value for you based on what you do or based on who you are? It's a good question. Is God's value for you based on what you do or who you are? Who you are. Okay, let's talk about this for a minute. Luke 15, uh, verse 8 through 10. There's a great parable from Jesus himself. It says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what makes the coin valuable? It's, if it's a gold coin, it's, it's what it's made out of. It's, it's the, when, it, when it comes to, to gold, the value in gold is built into the gold, right? It's not something gold does. Has gold ever got up and done anything for you? No. <laughs> you never woke up in the morning and the, all the dishes are done. You're like, wow, thanks, gold. Wow, you're, <laughs> you're more valuable than I thought you were. No, it's, it's, it's because of, of what it's made out of. It's built into its DNA. Well, it doesn't have DNA, I don't think, but let's just say it does. It's built into the DNA. And, and so the, 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 the value is built in to the object, right? So this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, like, each one of you is like this gold coin, and, and it's not, and, and, it's, and it's talking about in the context of being a sinner, right? So it's not talking about perfect people, and here is the Lord searching for these coins and rejoicing whenever he gets one back. The value is already built into you. So it's not about our performance. It's not about all the things we can do. So if we're making mistakes and we're confirming a story about ourselves that is negative, we need to be really careful with that. All the babies are talking. They're like, hey, you're a baby, so am I. <laughs> but heaven rejoices over you at your worst moment right because it says that when a sinner repents this is not a perfect person right the value is already built into you so we got to be really careful that we don't put we don't determine our value uh based on what we do but rather who we are and who god says we are and that way we can make mistakes because we're going to, and we don't have to sit there and beat ourselves up like we're the worst person on the planet because we left bacon outside, <laughs> which is pretty bad, pretty bad. right? I know. <laughs> I thought for a second, I looked at it, I was like, I wonder if it's still good. <laughs> that is bad, right? I, I just, I went with my gut that said, just throw it away. But even the scripture says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. How many of you guys understand that this is, this is something God says about you before you do anything in your life? Right? This is where you start. This isn't something like later, like God's like, wow, good job. You did it. Now you're, you're awesome. No, it's, it's, this is something that's built into us. Um, and, and even furthermore, if, if you've given your life to Jesus, the, the Bible says you have a right to, to live and be called a child of God. I mean, come on, that is, that's, yeah, that's, that's valuable, right? That is super valuable. That if, if you've given your life to Christ, you, you get this amazing thing. And that you're actually royalty. Could you imagine, like, to the king of kings that that's a big deal so value v valuable is who you are it's not something that you become by being perfect uh, the only one that perfects us is christ right and so we're going to make some mistakes uh let's talk about hope deferred you know in those moments that we have hope deferred because you know i i think 
even when it comes to God's plans over our life, you know, how many of you guys had somebody say, wow, God's got some plans for you? Has anybody ever heard that? And you're like, you hear that and you're like, great, tomorrow we start. <laughs> and yeah, you start, but it's a slow start. Like, you know, it's like you're in, in process and it, sometimes it feels like, you know, sometimes it feels like nothing's happening and, and then something does happen and then you're excited and then, you know, something, you know, will happen that maybe kind of crushes your spirits a little bit. Um, we need to be really, you know, careful about that and, and go back to what the Bible says, uh, Philippians 1, six. being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So God's not starting a work in you and then just like quitting the job and going and doing another job, right? Maybe you guys have had a contractor or something like that once that like starts a work and then it's like, where'd he go? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, John's like, oh, I know that guy. <laughs> Anybody in Oregon. <laughs> oh my gosh. But that's not the Lord, right? The Lord is not out to lunch, First uh, Timothy 1.18, it says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. You know, one way that we can go, get through these times of hope deferred is going back to what, what is God speaking over our lives. And if you guys need to come and, and get some, uh, some prayer from our team and um, and, 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 and find out. Maybe you haven't experienced any prophetic ministry. Uh, Tuesdays at Cavista, we meet, and um, we will focus just on you and help, you know, and, and encourage you and, and, and know what, what the Lord is, is, is speaking over you. Uh, it's important. It's important because what is, what is Paul basically acknowledging here? He's acknowledging that there will be times where hope will f feel deferred. And that there, there is, uh, there's tools in our tool belt to, to have success, right? Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, we know this scripture, but for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. So when I got, you know, denied this purchase, I instantly felt like there was no hope that my future was set, that my past was always going to be a defining part of who I am, and it was very discouraging. It's very discouraging. And so I need to go back and remember that the Lord's like, man, I got a, a future and a hope. I got plans for you. And uh, get myself out of that place of thinking like, man, I'm just stuck, right? Like there's no hope because there always is hope. So let's talk about stress a little bit. This is a big one, Okay. Let's talk about worry. Let's talk about stress. Matthew 6, 25, uh, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. There, this is Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. I want to just pause there for a second. What did Jesus say? Do not worry about your what? How many of you guys worry about your life? <sighs> okay. All right. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm excited. It says, what you'll eat, drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food, the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of, of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No? no? Oh, good answer. And why, don't, why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, fire will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. A, a big amen. We're going to talk about this a little bit because this is where we fall into the category of we trust the Word of God, we know the Word of God, but we don't apply the Word of God, okay? 
And we're going to talk about this because I'm guilty of this too, so I'm talking to us. Sis. And maybe there's some of you in here that are knocking this out, and if so, I'm, I'm really proud of you for doing that, and, and we're going to talk about why. Um, when it comes to uh, worry, worry is different than making plans. Making plans is good, okay? Worry bad, all right? So you should make plans, you should plan and, 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 and do stuff like that, but hold those loosely, of course, because the Lord can change those and, and all that, so we want to hold on to our plans in, in, with, with an open hand. But worrying is not planning. Worrying is freaking out and telling ourselves all the bad stories and the anxieties and, and all that stuff. And what did Jesus say? He said, do not worry. That's, a, that's something that Jesus is telling us not to do. And yet, Almost all of us, if we're honest, probably worry. What does that tell us? We're not listening to what Jesus said. <laughs> we're not doing it. Okay, that's good. We're going to get into that a little bit more. So how about, so that's looking forward. How about looking back? There's something in Philippians chapter 3, uh, 13 through 14 that, that uh that I like. It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. How many of you guys also have struggle with thinking about the past? Okay. What is, what's the apostle saying not to do? He's saying to forget the past. Like you can't, it's not helping you. It's gone. <laughs> You're like trying to be Uncle Rico and Napoleon Dynamite. Like if I could just get back to 1989 and throw that football again, like everything will be. <laughs> Don't be Uncle Rico. <laughs> and, and also, you know, you think about it, it's a lot of times we, we, we use the past to try to determine what kind of future we'll have. And that's, inc that's extremely problematic. Your past is gone. It's done. You're a new creation in Christ. You are not defined by your worst day. You're defined by, by who Jesus is and who God says you are, right? So you got you to gotta forget. Give yourself permission to let go of the past. So let's go back to, to worrying. The Bible says to you and to me to stop worrying. And so what do we do? We oftentimes, we pray to God, take away my worry. And God says, yeah, the Bible says stop doing that worry thing. And then we're like, yeah, but please take away the worry. And God's like, I, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> the Bible's telling you to stop doing that worry thing. Lord, please disempower the worry in my life. And Jesus is like, I'm not the one empowering the worry. You are. That's a big deal. That's a, there's a little bit of a difference there, don't you think? It, 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 it's, it's, it's my choice to either empower it or to disempower it. I'm not helpless. <laughs> I'm just not good at denying myself. The worry is like an itch that wants to be scratched. It's like this fear that if I'm not constantly just looking at this thing, something could go wrong. Maybe God won't show up. Maybe you name it. There's, it's a result of us not trusting God's ability to take care of us. Because if we've really trusted God's ability to take care of us, if we believe what Jesus said, if we've really believed that, why would we worry? We would plan, but we would not worry. If the Bible says not to do something, maybe it's time to stop doing it. Yeah. Not just give it a try, but to actually remove permission from your life to worry. Say, I don't give myself permission to do that anymore. And you might think, well, won't people think I'm crazy? Yeah, but <laughs> don't worry about that because you're not of this world anyway. You're a new creation. You're supposed to look and do life differently. 
The freedom from these dirty little strength killers is found in God's promises in his way of living life. If we choose to ignore the teachings of Jesus and embrace inferior ways of living, we will most assuredly suffer the very things that Jesus was trying to spare us from by giving the teaching in the first place. If we ignore what Jesus is telling us to do, and we embrace an inferior way of doing life, which is worry. Jesus said, don't worry. Living a life of worry is inferior to what Jesus said. Then we're actually going to suffer the very things that Jesus was trying to spare us from by giving us the teaching in the first place. An inferior standard will always produce inferior results. Jesus is trying to bring freedom into my life. He's trying to save me from having to live a life that is stressed out all the time. But if I ignore his teachings, I will suffer. It's, it's simple when you think about it, right? It's simple when you think about it. But I will, you know, acknowledge that trusting God on that level seems a little bit scary. But isn't that, isn't that what trust really is? It, it's like if I trust something that, that doesn't give me any sort of like pause, if it's just like laid out in front of me and I can see it all and I can, I, it's super tangible, like saying like I have, I have deep, great trust. It's like, well, I don't know if you do. Deep, great trust is when it's like you're actually stepping out and taking a risk. But the only way that we're going to experience the truth of what the scripture says is by taking that risk. So either we can get out of the boat and walk on water, or we can stay in the boat our entire life and wonder what it might be like to walk on water. Right? These are some of the, the deep changes that we need to make in our life as a new creation. I think many of us settle for putting on the superficial changes that come with being a Christian, but utterly neglect the deeper changes that will set us apart from the rest of the world and strengthen us. We'll stop cussing, we'll stop smoking, drinking, etc. all the cosmetic stuff. It's like, yes, I'll do that. Give me a checklist. But it's the inner changes that really make all the difference. Do I think it's good to, you know, clean up your foul mouth if you got one? Yes, I, I prefer that. But, like, that, that's not the most important thing. That's not the most important thing. And too often in the church, we value these things over the actual stuff that really makes the, brings the breakthrough in our life. I would rather you have bad lang colorful language and stop worrying than I would have you have really, what's the opposite of colorful language? That's not fun to say it. Not colorful language. But be filled with stress and anxiety. Now, if you, can, if you can do both, that's great. But I'm just saying it's the inner changes that are really going to make the difference. If you only clean the outside of the cup, you will still feel the same on the inside as you always have. Right. You may even get angry with God saying, I did all this cleaning. Why aren't I different? Right? Because that's like, I did all these things for you, God. I stopped cussing. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. How come I still have anxiety? And God's like, but you're not really applying what I taught. It's the inside of the cup that makes the biggest difference. You know, I always look inside of cups before I take a drink out of them. Yeah. It's because I saw this movie, Arachnophobia, back in... <laughs> Some people know what I'm talking about. And there was like a spider in a coffee cup. Oh, gosh. Um, the inside of the cup matters. <laughs> It's true. The inner change is going to take courage to step into new ways of doing life, and it may feel scary, but the Holy Spirit is right there with us, right? And strengthening us. But you have to say, today is the day that I start living out the teachings of Jesus. You have to really, and I do too, I have to ask myself the question, am I really living what he's saying to live or is it just a scripture that i've memorized that i can share whenever somebody else is dealing with stress and i'm like hey remember don't worry and then i'm just like have all kinds of worry yeah right not the purpose and and what's at stake i'm telling you it's the abundant life 
Jesus said, man, I've come to give you life and life abundant. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And anxiety, stress, these things, these are not, these are not gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Maybe a spirit, but not, not God's Spirit, okay? So we need to recognize and, and say no to the things in our life that are, are, that are trying to kill and steal and destroy things. Because none of us, you know, if we were honest, we would say, I don't want that. So if we don't want it, we need to do something about it, right? Romans 12, 1 through 2, and I, I promise I'm coming to an end here. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the part here that I want to really show you guys, hold on, stay with me, is this piece here where he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Okay? We need, we're, we're called to be different. Okay? The world has, puts value on worry, puts value on stress. They might not say it, but they do, and they're all doing it. Everybody's living that way because they think it's somehow protecting them from the, the unknown, uncontrollable little things in, in the world. But it's not. It's just wrecking. We have an advantage. We have Holy Spirit. We have God. We can trust our Father who values us more than gold that He will look out for us and we don't have to live in worry. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm telling you, my experience is there's sometimes there's some supernatural, you know, ob awesome, miraculous, you know, times where my mind has changed. But then there's, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of, hey, why don't I try something different? Why don't I start living the way Jesus recommends or commands to live and see if it's better? And then when my mind realizes that, yes, it is better, my mind is changed. My mind is renewed. At the end of the day, none of us can get rid of the, the, the world of little, dirty strength killers. Playing defense is only reactionary. So if we're just going to wait and do something when it happens, good luck with that. I, I'm not having a great time with that myself. So let's disempower those little things before they even have a chance by changing the way you think about yourself by trusting God with your future, your provision, and by living out the actual word of God. Doing it. Being filled with worry and anxiety is the influence of the wrong spirit. The Holy Spirit is always leading us into freedom. And so it's time that we take a look at what Jesus actually taught not just read the Bible to check it off and say, I read the Bible today, I got my 10 minutes in, you're welcome. But to actually <laughs> take a look at it and ask yourself, stop and say, am I doing that? And be honest. Don't make up excuses of why it's okay to not do that sometimes. I don't see Jesus ever saying that, well, yeah, but there are times where you should worry. No, it doesn't say that, okay? Maybe it's loving your enemies. Maybe, you know, whatever it is that Jesus said, be real with yourself. Because if you want to experience an abundant life, you're going to have to be real with yourself and recognize the areas that you're not living in obedience to what Jesus is calling you to. Trust that he is calling you into freedom and then to decide to do something about it. Say, okay, today is a day that I no longer give my permission to live in worry. Jesus said not to do it. That feels crazy, but you know what? I'm going to trust him. Amen.